good evening again. And I suppose uh, there will be some questions or comments uh, from our audience. So, or do you have Please something to say? Tonight, let's not talk about documentary filmmaking. Let's just talk about recent history. It's recent, you know. It's like the day before yesterday. And it concerns you more than it concerns me. I will say this. I haven't seen the film for 30 years or so. I, I wonder if, because at that time, I was not bored with archives. And that became later. Uh, and there's some awfully good archival material. But of course, there is already that which came much later. Fred Astaire dancing in the streets of London. Uh, that became much more part of my filmmaking later. Uh, there's probably too many politicians in the film. Maybe we could have shortened it by um, eliminating a few of them. Uh, not Anthony Eden. I loved Anthony Eden, and he liked me. He's also in the song, The Pity. I liked Anthony Eden, and I have to confess, I also liked Edouard Daladier. This is in the nature of a confession, because Daladier is responsible for Munich. Okay. Is there any question or comment? I was just wondering, how did you choose the uh, the person to talk to in then Czechoslovakia? So there's this uh, doctor, I don't know what his name was. Uh, so how did you, when, when you approached people, when you thought about who to speak to in Czechoslovakia, how did you approach that? Why didn't you speak to, for example, some of the government representatives? Uh, why or? didn't I speak to whom? Uh, to, for example, government representatives. At that time? <laughs> during the 60s. During the 60s. Yeah. You had uh, Dr. Wale. They wouldn't have said anything interesting, I think. <laughs> Please wait a moment. What was it that you liked about Anthony Eden, specifically? Yes. And secondly, could you tell us a little bit about how you went about creating a close relationship with some of those interviewees? It was clear that there was the beginnings of a friendship there very often. How did that happen and how long did that take and how did you go about it? The Earl of Avon, who was no longer prime minister because he stopped being prime minister after Suez. The Earl of Avon is awfully elegant, handsome, still in old age. You know, before the war, before the war, the contest, there were contests about who were the best dressed men in the world. And it was always between Anthony Eden and Cary Grant. Wow. He was 
so elegant. And he was married to one of the daughters of Winston Churchill. Uh, and whenever he gave interviews, uh, his wife went to London and told her, il était sous le pantoufle de sa femme. How do you say that in English? Uh, he, uh, and this Ch Churchill daughter knew that television crews uh, could destroy valuable furniture, porcelain, and uh, so she told Anthony Eden in what room he could sit. And uh, he and I sympathized a great deal. I think both in Munich and in the Salon de Pity, every time he says something, it's elegant and intelligent. Yes, I liked the Earl of Avon very much. And your, the second question, how did you go about creating warm relationships with many of your other interviewees? The small talk, the, the, the first words when you arrived. Uh, they're not always warm. I can, sometimes I have to bully people a little bit to get something interesting out of them. Um, you did see that Daladier is out of focus some of the time. And I think it's very, very funny when he says that the Bavarians after all, are like uh, are from the south of Germany, as he, of course, was from the south of France. Well, that's funny why, because the Bavarians were, and I think still are, the most reactionary of all the Germans. I think they still are. Uh, so it's funny. Uh, what he actually said, which isn't in the film, when he came back in the plane over Le Bourget, and he saw all these people waiting for him at the airport. He said, not to Bonnet. I don't think Bonnet was with him. Maybe he was. But to, to his, he said, who are all these people? And the answer was, well, they've come to applaud you. And Daladier said, Ah, les cons. <laughs> oh, that bunch of assholes. He did. He did say that. No. In contrast to Chamberlain, he was not proud at all of having come back from Munich. Thank you. Mr. Ophüls, there are two points where the picture was frozen and there were subtitles, once uh, with Edouard Daladier, the s second time with uh, the Czech uh, witness, uh, uh, Wale. And uh, is it yeah, possible there, there to say was today... There some strange censorship and can from, you from, from OETF because it, uh, that was made for French television. And then Arte asked me 
to do a somewhat shorter version for German television. And, but I don't remember the details because it's all so long ago. Uh, that's when I discovered that French television, for diplomatic reasons, had censored something that a, a conversation I'd had with Vela, surely for diplomatic reasons, uh, the RTF were great censors. The Gaulist television were already at that time doing a lot of censorship. What is the other place that was censored? I don't remember. The first one was with Daladier and the second one second with Wale. The one was Daladier. Why did they censor poor Daladier? I don't remember. It's still it's in the... At that time, uh, did you get the information why it happened? No. I didn't care that much. It was all very much in the past. I, I don't know why they censored it. As I say, probably because uh, from uh, somebody from the foreign, from foreign affairs came to look at the film, they always did, and decided uh, and asked Alain de Segui and Henri Aris and the bosses to take something out. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, during the shooting in Czechoslovakia, uh, was there some problems with the Czechoslovak authorities? The Czechoslovak authorities? Authorities. Of the time? Yeah. What, what uh, mm, 67, during, during the shooting. Oh, they didn't interfere, not at all, they helped. I mean, they were communists, Vela was a communist, uh, they were helpful. Just didn't feel like interviewing them, what was the question before because I didn't feel they had anything interesting to tell me. And also, the film was done on a shoestring. Uh, I mean, I had to do the voiceover of the people in the film. Uh, Yes, French television helped me. Joseph Pasteur uh, asked questions in France. Olivier Chattard asked questions in England. So at the time, French television was very helpful. But it was made on a shoestring. Uh, you hear my voice translating much too much. You hear my voice much too much in the film anyway. But that's because we didn't have much money. But the film got very good reviews in France. So that helped us for the sound of pity. Hello, good evening again. Thank you for a very interesting film. And uh, I would like to ask you, what uh, do you think is the most important message we can take away from this film for these days, 2017, uh, seeing the right-wing extremists rising again in Central Europe? Like, what, what do you like think about what can this film say to us in 2017? What is, in your opinion? What is the message? Um, you now have a milliardaire new president. There was another milliardaire 
an American milliardaire called Howard Hughes. He once said, if you want to send a message, use Western Union. <laughs> So should we do it now? Like, should we use Western Union? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I just make films. I try, uh, and whatever the message you get from the film is okay with me. It's your own business, not mine. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> So gladly everyone here will take a different message. Thank you again. <laughs> well, of course, someone can say something to Mr. Ophiels, his or her interpretation. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, you said that it got quite good reviews in, in France. Uh, where are, where are you? Yeah, <laughs> yes. How about other countries where it was screened? Was, how are the reviews in other, other countries, like in UK? If it was screened in UK, the, the, the film? You have mentioned reviews uh, in France, that they were positive. So do you know something about reviews in other countries than in France? Yeah. I remember that Francois Mauriac, great French writer, liked the film very much. Uh, bon vent le best, get that very much. In other countries, yeah, in England, they liked the film very much. Uh, how did it go over in Germany? Right now, I don't even remember if at the time the film was shown. Oh, yes, of course it was. It was because Alain Sedoui and I had sold it just before 68. That's how I later got a job in Germany. Had sold it to Egon Monk in Hamburg. So NDR showed it, yes. Uh, um, German television showed it. Yeah, that's uh, good uh, reviews. How about it, Italy? Hmm? Italy. Did they Sorry? Uh, in, in Italy. In, 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 Italy? in Italy, if you perhaps in know Italy? In, in Italy. Gee, I don't know. <laughs> okay. But was it offer, did you offer the movie also to Czechoslovakia at the time? The, uh, the question is uh, whether this movie was offered uh, to Czechoslovakia. I have no idea. Okay. Really have no idea. Thank you. It was uh, probably a good question because today uh, we had the Czech premiere, which is uh, quite strange because before 1989, during the communist regime, the topic uh, the Munich Agreement was uh, quite strongly used by, let's say, the communist uh, no. uh, big narrative of history yeah, and no propaganda. In doing that. You just gave a good reason of why I didn't care to interview them. They had, no, uh, they had no strong reason to refer to the Munich Agreement or to denounce it. There is a new question. It's a question and it's also a response to what the young lady was asking before because I think it's, I found it very poignant that almost the last shot in the film is of the translator the interview with the translator. Here's this figure who was there at this great event, this world-changing event, but who is overlooked by history in traditional narratives of it. It's the big four. But here's this translator who has survived and gone through since 23, 1923, I think he was saying he was a translator. Sorry, 1923? Yes, he says it he was. It was the year 1923 is the year when Hitler spent, I think, six months in jail. In jail, yes. but he has gone through all this, all this, but he says with Edith Piaf, je ne regrette ah, rien. Admit, 
Yes. We're talking about Schmidt. Schmidt, exactly. Yes. And I think it's, it feels very significant that he is there at the end. And it's almost like that saying... That would do it all over again. Exactly. So well, do not be Speer, just a witness. Uh, Albert Speer says the same thing in the memory of justice. I was so ambitious that if I, if I had to do it all over again, I would probably do it all over again. So People to change, but you know what Freud said? You don't basically change after the age of four. <laughs> Not basically. Unless... Sigmund was probably right. Don't you think he was right? Sure, but you see a film like this, and I think it changes you. It can change you when you see how people behave and when you see, when you can take this from history. So thank you for the film, of course. Nice words. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, what do you think about the protagonists? Were they thinking they made the right thing about Munich Agreement? Or was, did they think uh, it was the right thing to do? That it wasn't a mistake? No, obviously Daladier does not think that, was, uh, that he, uh, Daladier felt trapped. And he didn't think that he had been right in signing. Um, and the other protagonists were dead. <laughs> I couldn't have interviewed them. <laughs> they were dead. So, uh, no, Daladier did not think it was a good idea. Uh, I never got to talk to Chamberlain. He was dead. Uh, no, he probably, he probably thought he had been made a fool of. And the film sh certainly shows that he was being made a fool of. But for the public probably, record? Lady Asquith, I think, uh, talks about that. I like Lady Asquith very much, incidentally. Her son was a very good filmmaker, Anthony Asquith. Made good movies, yeah. Uh, Lady Asquith, at one point, I don't remember seeing that, but maybe I was out having a a smoke. Uh, my wife always reminds me of, la uh, of Lady Asquith saying, uh, telling how she likes to, how she liked to talk to cab drivers, because they were the people. Uh, and Lady Asquith was not the people. So Regine always reminds me. That lady Asquith talks about. Is it in the film? I don't remember. Where she, this says, where she says she likes to talk to cab drivers. Maybe, maybe I took it out when I made the shorter version. That's too bad. I shouldn't have. I should have left that in. Uh, but Lady Asquith talks about Chamberlain and was quite convinced, she was a close friend of Churchill, that Chamberlain was perfectly sincere, that he wanted to be an angel of peace. Um, at some point we see an old man living in Prague, in Prague. I think he was uh, Jewish, and he says if there wouldn't have been Munich, then there wouldn't have been the war. Yes. So do you think there would have been a different solution at that point in time with the Sudets in, in Czechoslovakia? Yes, the film gives evidence of that. 
when you listen to Walter Warnimont, who was the third man in Okawe, Okawe right behind Kid, uh, Keitel and Jodl, who were hanged in Nuremberg. Warnimont got life, but then he didn't serve life. He was left out of jail before. He wasn't hanged. And Valimont says that, the, that at that time uh, it would have been a war on two fronts, that the secret line was not finished, that there were not enough divisions, and that the Czech army was a very well-armed army. Several of the witnesses say that. So, um, yes, had they not, had, had they, had they, the two men who signed the Munich Agreement for the West, Chamberlain and Daladier, had they not, not, not done it, What would Hitler have done? Nothing. He couldn't have. And what would have happened then to the to the areas, the border areas? Oh, I don't know. I'm not a prophet, and I'm not a professional historian. Uh, certainly, there's even. There's even the argument that if there hadn't been Munich, Hitler could not have stayed in power. It was a poker game. And der Führer won. He was, I was asked by a journalist today if there's a dick, it seemed an honor question uh, about Donald Trump and Hitler. What are the resemblances? Well, not a great many. Hitler was very smart. <laughs> Donald Trump is a fool and an idiot. But Donald Trump might get us into another war, that is true. Because he's a megalomaniac and a fool. Hitler was anything but a fool. He was caricatured for many years. I was, I think, the first one who broke this rule. And this is the only film where you really see Hitler speak and hear him talk. I think I was the first one who did that because at the time people, including journalists and filmmakers, still were scared that he might convince people, if you heard him speak. So they avoided it. And I said, because I'm a frivolous fellow, what the hell? Let them, let them hear the man speak. It's part of history. Thank you. Good evening, Good evening, Mr. Elfios. Um, I would like to, on behalf of the festival, um, louder, okay. Yes. So on behalf of the whole festival team, um, I would like to say one more time how happy we are that you are here and how happy Thank we you. are that we can uh, celebrate your special anniversary, the 19th anniversary, which is next Wednesday. And we do have a little present for you. Uh, mm -hmm. A few of them, actually. <laughs> Oh, a few wow. presents. Um, 
It's the war credit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. How wonderful. Thank you. And thank you all. Happy birthday, happy birthday to you. No. Thank you. No. Thank, thank you. Um, just, just a little comment on the present. We um, did make cake 90 in Ihlava, but we heard that um, that's not the right thing for you. So what we are going to do afterwards is uh, distribute the cake to the visitors outside of the Absolutely. cinema. It will wait out there for I'll you. Have a little bit of it. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now, what I heard from um, from our program team, our wonderful program team, I heard that you are a big fan of not really cakes, but um, Prague ham and oh Prague yeah. beer or, or Czech yeah. beer. Yeah. So yeah. that's why we um, this ham th is th this whole thing is a huge pack of the finest ham we could find in oh um, in the Czech Republic and and the Pilsner for you. Thanks. So um, happy birthday one more time! Thank you so much for being here.